this session I'll co be covering uh, paradigm modeling. As you notice, uh, I take a somewhat uh, more untraditional approach in the sense that I first cover pregame and then variogram modeling in the sense that uh, it'll give variogram modeling a little bit more complex since it's uh, possibly a little bit more of a theoretical, very difficult concept uh, compared to what we've seen before. So why do we do variogram modeling? And why not just say, okay, I have some uh, observations I have calculated an experimental variogram, imagine an experimental variogram in one dimensions, and I have a number of um, uh, semi-variances calculated, and I notice here, I can just, why don't I can just interpolate these linearly or piecewise linear? The answer to that question lies in the fact that uh, Kriging solves a linear system of equations. So uh, that linear system of equation uh, depends, of course, on the variogram uh, values that we calculate, and so this system has to remain positive definite and should not be singular. So can we therefore just use any interpolation method? The answer for that is no. Uh, if we would be just using any interpolation method, then you can imagine um, if you look at, at the bottom here, which is the creating variance, which is the variance minus something that for certain functions uh, of covariances, this, uh, this could become negative. And so a negative creating variance is basically meaningless. So we need to have functions uh, that we know uh, a priori that have been investigated that would always provide us with these positive uh, Kriging, uh, Kriging variances. And so um, people in theory, in just statistical theory, have developed uh, what those functions are. I'm not going to go into what, why this is in the development itself. I'll, I'll just be providing you with a list of functions. The, of, of course, the other obvious reason for modeling variograms is that in the variogram calculations, we only look at distances between data points. So imagine you have only four data points. Uh, of course, we can't really calculate the variogram of that, but imagine there are many more other data points. Then the distance, for example, uh, existing here uh, between data point and unknown, uh, that lag distance does not necessarily occur in our, in our data set. And so in order for us to do Kriging, we need to have this lag distance and we need to calculate the variogram for that lag distance by reading that off. And that would require doing some kind of interpolation. So the overview then is uh, first work in 1D uh, and provide you with uh, listed functions in 1D and then uh, going to 2D. And there's often, um, the challenge for novices in geostatistics is understanding the difference between 1D and 2D. 2D is not simply a series of 1D directions. No, 2D is its own, own space with its own fabric, and so we need to be mindful, again, in defining uh, listed variograms in 2D. So you can't just extrapolate from 1D to 2D. And then we'll talk also a little bit about nesting of variograms, which then can be used, for example, to model zonal anisotropy. Okay, so in uh, in one D, uh, we start with the simplest of simple models, which is the pure nugget effect model. Now, this model, of course, is very simple. It says the variogram is zero at the origin, and then it's equal to a straight line. So that's what we observe here. And here, the variance is one, but you can imagine having uh, essentially any kind of uh, variance. Now, this is of course not a useful model. You would never model a pure nugget effect simply because you're admitting that everything is noise, and therefore you know, the best prediction in least square sense you can make is simply the mean. But so the nugget effect model will then come in, in when we talk about nesting variograms. So the nugget will be then simply be seen as one component of the variogram and where there are other structures or components available to you. A very common model is called the 1D spherical model. It's a model like this, and we've seen this kind of behavior um, already uh, in many uh, of our previous variogram calculations. And so it starts at zero, and then what the most important thing, as you notice here, is that the tangent to the origin is simply a straight line. Uh, and then it levels off and becomes constant uh, at a certain point, which we call that point is here A, and then A is the range. So <laughs> if we look at uh, this behavior at origin, which is something uh, that we'll uh, look at in the next two slides, then if we would have uh, signals like this, they would all look like they have a spherical variogram. So if you calculate the variogram of these signals, you'll find that they behave linear at the origin. 
So in the next two slides, I'll show you two different behavior. One where we have behavior where the variogram increases faster than linear, so for example, exponential. In one case where the variogram increases slower than uh, linear, and that is called Gaussian. And so as you notice that that increase at the origin uh, is very important because it has a tremendous effect on the nature of the signal that you're investigating or interpretation of the signal that you have. You notice that if I go faster at the origin, I get a signal that is much more varying. Uh, it doesn't contain any noise, it's just much more varying versus a signal like this, which obviously has much more smoother variation. And so therefore the correlation at small short distances is much smaller. So you can already understand that in terms of variogram modeling, what's really important is what happens uh, at the origin. Uh, and so that's a, a something I will uh, come back to when we're looking at some practical cases. So here we see that 1D uh, exponential model. You notice that now my behavior uh, ex exponentially increasing. And it, because it's an exponential function, unlike the spherical model, it never levels off. So what we have is a function that only reaches the sill asymptotically. But in reality, because of noise of the data and sampling variances, uh, what we have is essentially is, is that at 95%, uh, we call that what is called the practical range. So when A is 15, then you would be around this area. You see that you kind of have leveled off pretty much. The Gaussian variogram is uh, then the opposite. Uh, it goes slower than linear and then it's much flatter at origin and again has that practical range. Okay, now we come to the important observation of two-dimensional variograms. Mm -hmm. So imagine I have um, a data set uh, and I've calculated variogram in various directions. And so here is a data set, um, as a picture I found on, on, on the internet, which I uh, acknowledge here, uh, this person. Uh, I think it's a really nice picture that shows that uh, indeed you can have variograms this is the uh, empirical variogram uh, along the, say, 105 degree direction, and these are along the 15 degree direction. And so one way of representing um, this, these two variograms is essentially going into what is called the variogram map. So the variogram map has 0, 0 here at the origin, and then it simply looks at these points here, these variogram values, which are called semi-variances. Remember, variograms are it's nothing more than the average square uh, the average square difference between any two values at a certain lag distance uh, divided by two. So that's why we call it semi-variance. And simply plotting that along this 105 degree direction, uh, imagine that would be these, these several uh, values here, these green values. And so uh, if you plot those green values, then, um, or if we look in 105 degree direction, we look at these green values, that will be the same as these values over here. And so if you look at the other direction, the 15 degree direction, then uh, what we get is a quicker rise. So we could go quicker from these low semivariances, the green values into the red values. And so what we notice if we then imagine doing that for all directions uh, and imagine that all our calculations eventually are sort of bounded by these two here, by this gray and this blue line. So what you would then have is that your variogram map will sort of look like this. And what we can now discover in this variogram map is some kind of an ellipsoidal variation uh, in terms of where the range is. For example, in the 105 degree direction, uh, my range is around, uh, let's see here, around say 2,500. In, the, in this direction, my range is much smaller, say around, um, around 1,000 or a little bit more. And that's what we observe here. So that also means that if I calculate the variogram along any other direction, I can find that those ranges lie on this ellipsoid. So the way we're going to describe a 2D variogram is essentially by looking at how the range varies uh, per direction and describe that with a model that's an ellipse in 2D and an ellipsoid in 3D. And that's an important uh, realization. Is, is that the 2D variogram is something that has to be described in an ellipse. And so an ellipse will have, uh, in our case, will have essentially uh, three parameters. It will have the axis uh, in this direction, the length, the length in this direction, and the orientation of this ellipse. And that would then describe that 2D variogram. Plus, of course, the type. The type here, as you notice, is Gaussian. 
So uh, the way we describe a 2D variogram in this case is say there's some nugget, there's a type that's Gaussian, and I have an elliptical variation of the range, so I need three parameters. So in essence, you need five parameters, nugget, type, and these three components. So this is just a summary of the same thing. I mentioned um, that uh, the way we calculate variograms along various directions, and we, pro we provide that visually often by looking at individual directions and looking at 1D variograms. The thing you have to realize is that these uh, 1D variograms, when calculated in 2D or 3D data, are really intersections uh, of, of a 2D and 3D uh, variogram. And so that's often a major confusion in, in variogram modeling. As, as we start modeling, what you should not try to do is to fit individual 1D variogram. You have to create a mental image in your mind of this geometric anisotropy. And again, this geometric anisotropy can be related to actual phenomenon that you would know exists. For example, I know that in the vertical I have more variation than in the horizontal. So this has to be somehow create, has to go somewhere into the variogram model. So how is then geometric anisotropy uh, defined? So we said in 2D, it will require an ellipse. And as you know, an ellipse in 2D requires essentially uh, three parameters, which is uh, the convention in SGEMS that is being used is, is this axis plus an azimuth, which is in a rotation from north-south or y-axis. In 3D, you have an ellipsoid. Uh, but most cases, uh, which has six parameters, that would be the three axes, A, B, C plus an azimuth rotation, plus a dip rotation, plus also a plunge rotation. And so the SGEMS book uh, or other geostatistical books will explain to you all these three angles. My own experience is that uh, for many cases, uh, you need only really four parameters, which is the azimuth rotation uh, and the three uh, ellipses, uh, the three ABC, the three angles, the, sorry, the three axis lengths. The reason for that is if you're in sedimentary system or, or earth layered systems, it's often the vertical that has the smallest uh, range. And so that means that the dip in many cases is zero. And even if you have dip, you can always transform the coordinates of your domain into a more flat domain on which you can then calculate variables. So this is then the geometric anisotropy in 2D that I showed uh, as before. Uh, so geometric anisotropy essentially means that you are saying that the range in various directions follows an ellipse. So that what you would read is say, okay, I have a direction of maximum continuity that I have the largest range, direction of minimum continuity I have the smallest range, so this is orange here, the black here, and anything in between lies in between. That would be this particular range, for example. So now we've covered uh, geometric uh, anisotropy, which is, uh, allows you to model uh, variations of ranges that are different in different directions by means of an ellipse. A second uh, often important observation uh, in reality is that our phenomenon is basically a nesting of individual spatial frequencies. What do I mean by that? So imagine here that I have an image, which as you notice, is a very short range, uh, has a short, a short range. It's isotropic, has a short range. So if I calculate the variogram here, I'll find this red variogram over there. So that's a pretty short range. If I look at this other image, um, then it has obviously it's, um, first of all, it has less variance. Uh, so the variance of the, if you calculate the histogram and the variance, you will see that it's less than, than this variance. Therefore, the variogram that you have has a lower sill, which is the blue variogram here, and, uh, but has a larger range, which is the, the fact that we have larger patches here. So you can imagine if I now add these two images up, I get this third image. And so this third image, if I calculate the variogram, it will be this variogram here. So basically what we have is we're saying that a phenomenon like this one is written as two, uh, say, orthogonal phenomenon, which are, which are these two here, that we can add up and create a new phenomenon that basically has two components. And so if you, that also means that you can add up the variogram. So if you notice here, if I take this blue variogram, add up this red variogram, I get the green variogram. And in the green variogram, I notice now that it's no longer the simple spherical structure that I have, but I have sort of two kinks in there. I have this first part, this first straight line. Uh, when that levels off, then the second straight line kicks in and you get this one and then you get the total. And the total variance is then the sum of the variances of each of these components.
And so that is nesting. And I just kind of described again here, uh, you can nest in many different ways. You can add a nugget effect, you can add a trend, you can add a small scale patchiness. And if you add that all up, you get this other variegram, which then contains the trend, the nugget effect, and the small scale patchiness. So the question now is, how will we model nesting of these spatial frequencies? In other words, if I have this now as observation, not these two, uh, what would the variogram look like and how would I model that variogram? Okay, so how does now nesting uh, work in two dimensions? Well, uh, because in the previous case, we just had an isotropic case. And so in two dimensions, I can have an isotropy. That means in my nesting, I may have nesting various anisotropies. And we'll see an example of that in the next uh, slide. As I know, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, uh, you saw that uh, a nesting essentially is an, a an addition, an adding of two spatial components. And so this literally translates into adding of variograms. For example, I can, as you noticed in the previous slide, I've added a, a one-dimensional variogram plus another one-dimensional variogram. Each had their own contributions, which showed those variances and added up to a total variance. What I have now to do is to add up two-dimensional variograms. And as per our previous analysis, we saw that a two-dimensional variogram requires the definition of an isotropy. And that requires a definition of these, uh, at least at a minimum, of some kind of ellipsoidal variation of the range with direction. So what I'm adding up here is basically two of these ellipsoidal things, uh, where, for example, the first component, I, uh, the first component I, I can use an isotropic. This is just an example. Uh, and so the way that will show up in my variogram is that um, in every direction, I'll find this first part, the shortest range here, that first towards that first kink, is the same in all of these uh, variograms. The second part, however, you notice I've chosen a, a geometric anisotropy with uh, a length in this, say, uh, minus 15 degree direction that is larger than in this uh, other direction here, the 75 degree uh, direction. And so what that results into is a variogram that in the uh, in the in this direction has that short range, which is this guy here, and has that long range component, which is this guy, which doesn't really occur much in the other case because I have essentially uh, ranges that are, are are almost the same in both directions for these two components. This is a slight difference. And so the way you do that again is now you have to specify a number of things, which is you have to specify the ellipsoid for each of those. So in 2D that requires at least three parameters, you have to specify the contribution of variance, which is a parameter of, of each one of them. So here's a, a slightly more complicated example of how that will work. So I have this data set here, uh, which shows in this box. Uh, and I calculate the variogram in two directions, in, in the 45 degree direction and the minus 45, the minus 45 degree direction and the 45 degree direction, I find these uh, two variograms. So uh, the blue variogram is the variogram that is calculated uh, in this minus 45 degree direction, and the red one is calculated in the 45 degree direction. How do I know that? Well, if you describe this image, um, what you can see is that you see basically, again, two frequencies. First is that you have uh, these large red patches and these large blue patches, and they seem to be oriented uh, in this 45 degree uh, direction. So there's more continuity for this in that direction. And that also means that uh, in this direction, the minus 45 degree direction, which is the blue variogram, I get a larger range and that range is around 50. So this image I think is about 100 by 100. Uh, if I look at the orthogonal direction, and then I see that that range is much smaller. But that's not all, all that there is to it. Because as I go smaller and look at smaller lag distances, it essentially means uh, looking at uh, zooming into your your image, I start to notice now that the uh, anisotropy at small different uh, small scales. If I this would be my uh, my image, then what I would get is essentially an anisotropy that's now orthogonal. Because you notice that I have now these features, such as shown here, that are aligned in the 45 degree direction, and they're longer in the 45 degree direction than in the in the minus 45 degree direction. So that also means that if I look at the variogram that the variogram has that kink again here. In the red variogram, it occurs later because it has longer uh, correlation in this direction. And in the blue variogram, it occurs earlier for smaller lag distances because uh, what we notice in this minus 45 degree direction. 
So this variogram can easily be written as a, as a, as a sum of two geometric components, uh, each with their own um, azimuth and each with their own uh, maximum and minimum uh, ranges. Okay, now what about zonal anisotropy? So zonal anisotropy, uh, we notice, is essentially uh, a case where the variance is now changing with direction. So that essentially means here, for example, in this case, is that in the vertical direction, you see a larger uh, range, but a larger variance than in the horizontal direction. You Sorry, you see the same range, but a, uh, uh, a lesser uh, still. So that's a smaller variance. So how do we deal with this situation? Well, the way it's dealt with is essentially the same as with uh, geometric uh, anisotropy. You're going to explain zonal anisotropy as uh, basically, again, a sum of two geometric anisotropies. The first component in this particular case would just be the regular spherical part with range 25. And the second one that I will have will have essentially infinite range in the major direction. Uh, which has no variability at all. So specifically here to the, uh, this case is you want to have add an, a variogram up with an infinite range. So let me illustrate that a little bit in the, uh, in the, in the next uh, slide. Okay, so here we have a, a beautiful case of uh, zonal anisotropy. So we have the image on the left and we calculate variograms in various directions, which is the image on the right. And so clearly we see this strong layering uh, that existing. And again, uh, zonal anisotropy means that Essentially, if I walk along a line here, I will see mostly red. If I walk along a line here, I will see mostly blue. And so the variance that you observe going this direction versus the variance you observe going that direction is dramatically different. And so that shows up uh, when you calculate the variogram in the y direction, which has a whole uh, smaller cell than the variogram in the x direction or any other direction, including the 45 degree direction. So how do we how do we model something like this? So again, don't think in terms of individual 1D variograms and start one modeling 1D variograms. You have to think of this again in terms of anisotropy and ellipsis. So the way it will handle that is we're going to write our variogram as a sum of two geometric variograms, each of as a contribution. And so the first one is our regular uh, geometric anisotropy, which is um, has a, of course in our previous case because of the the y-axis has a an azimuth of 90 degrees, and we have a a max here and an a min here. So this is our standard, uh, our standard geometric anisotropy. Now we add to that um, essentially an ellipsoid that looks like this, which is saying in the a in this direction I, I'll still have the same, but as I go further and further in this direction, uh, my range becomes essentially infinite. So what happens then is because of the, the flatness of this, um, because of the extent of this ellipse, is that in this direction uh, you're no longer adding uh, this uh, component uh, simply because um, there the contribution of the variance uh, is zero. So this is how that looks like then uh, in the next slide. If you go to SGENS, uh, what we need is two structures. So we have geometric anisotropy with two structures. Uh, and in one case, um, I have just a regular uh, anisotropy. As you notice here, I use 25 and 10. Uh, and a 90 degree azimuth. That's what the, the first the yellow ellipse was in the previous slide. And then I have a second structure, uh, which is has, as you notice, a range of infinite uh, in that horizontal direction. So again, I have to turn my ellipsoid. And for the rest, I just have, again, this 10. And so if you, if you do that, uh, then you get these uh, variograms and you notice that you're fitting the variogram in this direction uh, quite well. So uh, what about then the contribution? Well, the contribution, um, you know, if you notice, it's it's about 0 0.4 here. So uh, so we can you can add uh, parts to that. Um, essentially, uh, you can change that with this uh, contribution. And then you can start, uh, you know, letting your imagination run wild a little bit. Is you can start mixing various ways of defining uh, to, uh, to to sort of ways of defining various zonal and geometric anisotropies. So this is our standard geometric anisotropy, would be the yellow ellipse. This, as you notice, is the case where you have the yellow ellipse plus that green ellipse. Um, what that does, that green ellipse, as you notice, it stretches out these uh, these red patches uh, more. Here you see these are still wiggly. Uh, in this case, these these are basically stretched out more, and that's what the effect is of that, uh, that other ellipse. 
Um, here you see that is then defined in orthogonal directions, and that's what you then see in the next slide. So this was uh, our case of um, scenario four was our case of geometric anisotropy. Uh, this is a case of um, zonal anisotropy, and um, here we see a case of sort of combinations of various uh, types of geometric and zonal anisotropy.